Hello, welcome back to the Space School of Lovers. Me, Peter, today we figured out how to play today. Back with another Star Wars story. Today we'll discover what would have happened had the two Zabrak brothers, Maul and Savage, killed the Sith Lord himself, Darth Sidious on Mandalore. Would they take his place, or would they start a new legacy of the Sith? Before we begin this video, special thanks to our patrons, voice actors, and everyone else part of the Central team. If you want a chance to win in our next giveaway, watch the end of the video, and I'll tell you all about how you can win. Also, if you see comments in the comment section, that is not me. I only announce winners of my contests in videos. Our story begins on a dreary night, the same night that the leader of Mandalore, Duchess Satine Kreez, was executed in her own throne room. The night loomed down on the capital city of Mandalore. A dark essence grew in the Force, as Jedi Obi-Wan Kenobi was saved by the Mandalorians that tried to overthrow Satine. He was welcomed into the Mandalorian War that had just begun. Though, before Obi-Wan left the planet to inform the Jedi Order of what had happened here, he felt a dark eminence fill the world. It was vile, and it was evil. It was like nothing he'd ever felt before. Sure, he could only assume that it was the death of Satine, leaving a sour feeling within him. But this was something much worse than that. This being the one with enough power to not just bring down Mandalore, but the entire galaxy. The fourth user that Kenobi just missed was the Dark Lord of the Sith himself, Sheev Palpatine. As he moved on a skiff across the city, Maul sat quietly in his throne room. He felt something evil. His mind was already in disarray, but this was something. Maul looked forward as he saw two Mandalorian guards lifted from their feet. The word Master trickled out of his mouth as he came to realize it was Sidious who was here. He was going to bring pain down on everything Maul had just built, because Sidious knew one thing. He knew that Maul had an apprentice. He was not a former student anymore. He had become a rival. There could only be two Sith a master and an apprentice, and Maul was no longer his apprentice. Sidious walked through the doors with his blue and maroon cloak. He looked vile as ever, like an accolade ready to kill. There was nothing that would stop him from fulfilling his mandate to the Sith Order. He sought to install a legacy to only himself. Sidious created everything, from the dispute above Naboo to the Clone Wars themselves, and he was not going to let any petty Sith assassin who fell victim to a Jedi Padawan dethrone him from everything he had built. After all, Maul was beaten by Kenobi. He was like a loyal wolf o wolf he would bow to his knees the moment Sidious raised his voice. When Sidious looked in the room, he saw a taller Zabrak warrior with piercing yellow eyes and yellow skin. As Maul jumped to his feet, Sidious looked at Maul and grinned. The former apprentice spoke up, asking what Sidious was doing here. Sidious looked around and stopped in the middle of the throne room. Sidious then asked what Maul was doing here, completely disregarding the question that he was asked. Maul growled under his breath as he told Sidious he was establishing a new legacy to himself. One that would achieve more than Sidious could ever hope to achieve. Before Sidious could rebuttal, Maul spun across the room igniting his lightsaber and the dark saber. Sidious and Savage were completely caught off guard as the two Sith ignited their blades. Sidious had two crimson blades and Savage had his double-sided blade. The Sith collided back and forth as Sidious was caught completely off guard by Maul's quick move into action. The Sith moved ravagely. Savage was a bit over his head in this battle. He had recently lost his arm to Kenobi, and now he was fighting the most powerful Sith Lord in generations. Maul knew how to play this game. They needed to keep Sidious moving and tire him out. If they could get Sidious to lose a Samina, he would be theirs. Maul twisted his body around as he used both of his blades to clash against Sidious's blades. The duel was heated and crimson lit the interior of the throne room. Sidious shoved himself forward as he leapt from his feet and collided blades with Savage and Maul in the middle of the room. His arms outstretched as he laughed to himself, throwing the blades towards Savage. The Sith Apprentice was lucky to defend himself against the ruthless strike from Sidious. Sidious pushed his advantage on Savage as the two got into a locked and heated exchange. Sidious had the taller Zabrak on retreat as he pushed him back ferociously. Savage tried his hardest to keep up, and then he swung forward, landing a power strike on Sidious as the Sith Lord flew from his feet. Maul and Savage joined up. As brothers, they stood side by side as Sidious growled and then looked into their eyes as he got back up to his feet. The Sith Lord was done playing games as he shot lightning from his hands at Maul and Savage. They both blocked the attack. Maul used his lightsaber to throw the lightning back at Sidious as he jumped into the air. Sidious took in the lightning as he blocked the dark saber raining down on him. He was on the edge as he stepped back and forth, and used everything he had to stand his ground against these two duelists. 
Savage ran forward and swung violently, throwing Maul off of his rhythm. This gave Sidious the perfect opportunity to strike. Luckily for Maul, he recovered soon enough to catch Sidious's blade with a hard block, and then he parried the Sith Lord. Maul and Sidious got into a heated exchange. The former master and apprentice locked blades as they danced back and forth in the throne room. Maul was careful to attack where he could as he struck at Sidious, slashing his fine robes off as they floated down to the ground. Sidious growled as he lunged forward. Maul placed an X in front of him with his lightsabers as he blocked Sidious and then rolled under him, kicking Sidious up as Savage landing a cunning punch to Sidious' jaw. The Sith Lord groaned as he rolled to the floor. He felt his jaw. It was broken. As he felt anger grow inside of him, he used the pain from the broken jaw to fuel him as he lunged towards Savage. Maul was quick to stop this as he force pushed Sidious away from his brother. Savage and Maul grouped up as they looked down at the Sith Lord. He shakily moved to his feet. He looked at the two of them, and then he thought about making an escape. He was in a tough situation. If he didn't escape this alive, everything he had done was for nothing. Dooku never had the vision to finish what he started. The Sith would be completely taken over by two brothers if this was allowed to continue. Sidious stood his ground with no visible route to escape. As he twisted his body around and got between the two brothers and began slashing at both of them aggressively, Maul saw that Sidious was fighting like a feral animal. It was like he was backed into a corner and he was fighting with everything he had as the throne room echoed with the sounds of combat. Lightsabers clashed and screamed as the three duelists moved around in formation, pushing off of one another and trying to seize the advantage. Sidious had little room for failure as he was caught being too aggressive. Maul slashed up and split Sidious's blade into two. Sidious bounced back. He had one lightsaber to fight these two brothers with. They moved in as hulking. Savage pushed aggressively against Sidious. He smashed his lightsaber against the Dark Lords as Sidious tumbled back off balance as he tried to hold his own against the raging Sith. Savage's strikes got heavier and heavier as he pressed himself forward. Sidious then tumbled backwards as he fell under the strikes of Savage. Maul walked up behind Savage as he grinned. Sidious lay on his back as he smiled at Maul. Part of him was proud of what Maul had accomplished. He had been a true Sith without achieving victory, but it was now clear that he was going to win this battle. Maul walked around as his apprentice, as he said, one legacy of the Sith falls, and the more powerful one grows in its place. As Sidious listened to Maul talk on and on, he shot lightning at the Sith Lord, sending Maul flying back. Sidious wasn't going to die listening to a monologue as he looked over to see Savage's blade pass through his chest as his eyes flickered and he died on impact. Savage turned around and looked at his brother, who growled and then stood up. It was clear that Sidious was dead. Savage and Maul looked at one another as Savage asked Maul what they were going to do next. Maul grinned. He knew that Sidious was out of the picture now. The new apprentice, Dooku, would carry on the Clone Wars, and depending on who became the interim chancellor, the war would most likely be prolonged. Savage was very curious as to what this meant, but Maul turned around and walked towards the throne as he laughed quietly to himself. There was a great positive to the death of Palpatine. While Savage wasn't exactly educated on the politics of the galaxy, Maul was smart enough to take advantage of this galactic scale war. The Clone Wars would be a great distraction for the two Sith and their little criminal empire to take over the Outer Rim. There was a lot of potential for Crimson Dawn to succeed in the absence of order. Savage kind of understood, but first Maul would have to get into contact with the Black Suns, Pikes, and Huts to decide what they should do in terms of escaping the galactic conflict and expanding their resources. The next coming weeks would see the Galactic Republic erupt into chaos. While Palpatine had been missing, it was obvious that the Republic needed a leader to guide them through the war effort. The galaxy was hard-pressed in battle, and Palpatine was going to a more militaristic approach. Of course, Dooku knew about the death of Palpatine. He felt it through the Force. And the Jedi and Republic, on the other hand, couldn't figure out if he was alive, or captured, or dead. Masa Meda would address the Senate, telling them that the Chancellor's personal shuttle was destroyed by the Separatists. While he knew that Palpatine was going to Mandalore, he knew that telling the Republic that Palpatine died on Mandalore would ruin the war effort for the Republic and deter them from shooting for a victory against the Separatists. The Galactic Republic really needed to pull together a victory campaign to swiftly end the war. The Galactic Senate would have to decide on electing a new interim Chancellor. This would be a hard task though especially because gridlocked in the middle of a galactic scale war, 
This would decide who would win this election for interim chancellor. There were several senators that agreed on the peaceful decline of the Clone Wars, but many people were also trying to take the war to the Separatists. While many of the senators inside of the Galactic Senate of the Republic respected the senator from Alderaan, Bail Organa, he wasn't the frontrunner. Instead, the Galactic Senate decided to favor the senator from the banking clan's homeworld of Scipio, Senator Nix Card. He would surge through the ranks of the senators and become the interim supreme chancellor of the Galactic Republic. There was a secret brilliance behind this move. The move was dictated by a majority of the Senate. While it was undecided whether or not the banking clans were really on the side of the Republic or the Separatists, the Senate did know that they needed the banking clans to approve a new loan to the Kaminoans to the purchase of additional troops. The Kaminoans could build more facilities around Taboka City, so that they could build a clone army for the Republic's needed war effort. Though the Senate decided that the Senator of Scipio would make a fine interim chancellor, so that they could have their favor with the banking clans, and a tough resolve against the Separatists. With Nix Card becoming the Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic, the Grand Army of the Republic would make a stronger resolve against the Separatists. Though the moment Nix Card got into office, he was contacted by Count Dooku, the opposition leader to the Republic. Count Dooku made a point to tell Nix Card that they would be working together to bring the Republic down. While this was what Nix Card was for, being the banking clans were part of the Separatist Alliance, he told Dooku that he wanted to ease the Republic into a position to fail. Dooku was glad to see that the Republic was ignorant enough to vote for a banking clan member into the role of Supreme Chancellor. For Dooku, he would assume the role of Sidious, as he would direct the war from both sides. With Chancellor Nick's card as a new leader of the Republic, the Jedi Council would approach him and try to help him with strategy and guidance towards the war effort. As the second year of combat saw a completely unbelievable change, the war carried on. The Separatists and the Republic would toy back and forth throughout the Mid and Outer Rim. With very little combat in the core, other than the bit of conflict on Cato Nemodia, the war effort continued to be pushy. With Amidala and Organas firmly standing against the war, and the war effort from continuing, they were essentially silenced as the Senate rallied behind Chancellor Card. The war would become more gruesome than before, as the Senate would pass a bill through the banking clans ordering new clone troopers for the Grand Army of the Republic. Though Dooku had an issue, he knew that no ordinary individual could have just killed his master. There had to be another Sith out there, and while Dooku knew about Savage and his brother, he wasn't entirely sure if the Jedi could have been the ones to do it either. Dooku did know that he had to orchestrate the rest of the war himself, though he would do it his way. And without the ability to become the Emperor of the Republic, he realized that he could have to use Nick's card to his advantage, until he could seize power from him, and then take over the Republic for himself. On the other side of the galaxy, Mandalore stood in control of the Sith. Without Sidious dethroning Maul and Savage, they tightened their grip and made sure to scare off any of the rebel and insurrectionists trying to take the Darksaber away from the true ruler of Mandalore. While many Mandalorian warriors didn't see it as such, it didn't matter. Because with Almec speaking on behalf of Maul, as the Prime Minister, the general population would see no reason to believe a Zabrak Sith Lord was ruling their planet. This would work to perfection as Maul and Savage would move away from their first secured planet of Mandalore. There was a lot that they would have to do if they ever planned on taking a stand against the Republic or the Separatists. But Maul was smart and he was patient. A patient, cunning individual was always a deadly one. Maul knew that he needed more allies, and he would call upon the Crimson Dawn fleet. It was very, very rudimentary at this point, but there was a young man growing through the ranks of the crime syndicate. His name was Dryden Voss. He was a cunning young man ready to kill anyone to seize more power and control. But there was also another feature. He was extremely loyal to the highest bidder. And because Crimson Dawn was expanding throughout the Outer Rim, it was clear they were the highest bidder. While the Clone Wars escalated, Crimson Dawn saw an opportunity for expansion, though this expansion would have them knocking on one of the Republic planet's doors. One of the several planets that bled with corruption was the Outer Rim world of Ryloth. It wasn't Cham Syndulla, rather the senator from the planet was very easily corruptible. Crimson Dawn would be able to take advantage of this weak and feeble mind of Om Frita. While Maul favored taking over the world, Om Frita offered a resolution to Maul, so that he and his criminal empire wouldn't barge down the small forces that the Republic had as an outpost on Ryloth. 
Samal was able to earn a great amount of capital from Om Fri Ta, while also being able to take advantage of trade routes also used by Ryla, and the ability to racketeer everything they could from the Tweelik homeworld. Maul wouldn't stop there though, more supplies only meant one thing, fuel to grow his empire. Maul would use Dryden Voss to take a group of Mandalorians and Black Sun Elite pirates to the waterworld of Mon Calamari. Maul knew that the fish people of Mon Cala could help produce a massive fleet. This would be a great test for the young Dryden Voss, to see if he was up to the task of holding control of space and demanding that a normal civilization bow down to Crimson Dawn. There was one issue though. The Republic had just brought peace to Mon Calamari, and the rivalry between the Mon Cala and the Corrin. The two peoples of the massive world had disputes, each backed by either the Separatists or the Republic, but now that the new king of the planet brought unity to both the peoples, it was up to Dryden Voss and the representatives of Crimson Dawn to make sure that the king of Mon Cala would negotiate with them. The difficult problem was that the king was under the protection of the Republic, but the Republic was not allowed to stay stationed on Mon Cala. When Dryden Voss arrived, the king of Mon Cala was very welcoming. His calm demeanor and over-the-top style carried him like a deep core politician. Unlike Maul and Savage, who demanded respect through their power, Dryden demanded respect through his elegance of wording, and his ability to convey a future that would see success for both parties. Of course, he just wanted to sell the image to the victim, and take everything they had, leaving them with just enough to keep them happy. Crimson Dawn couldn't offer Mon Cala protection. They could offer prosperity, though. Dryden understood that this deal wasn't a fear tactic like Maul's pursuit of Ryloth. Mon Cala needed to be won over with a price, and with a budget like the one that Crimson Dawn was growing, the king understood that he very well could make a strong profit if he worked with Crimson Dawn, leading to a happier population on Mon Cala. Mon Cala wasn't particularly known for its shipbuilding facilities, nothing like Corelli or Kuat, but in the midroom, they were renowned for their massive star cruisers. These cruisers were able to be transport vessels, not much capital ships, but transport ships. Crimson Dawn would use these as warships, but that wasn't told to the king. The king let Crimson Dawn into Mon Cala and allowed them to access their facilities, as they cooperated with one another to help build Crimson Dawn their trading vessels. At the same time, the Pike Syndicate used a secure deal with Corellia that would allow them to purchase turbo lasers that were used on Providence class dreadnoughts, the pride of the Separatist fleet, and of course turbo lasers that went on Benedict class Star Destroyers, the power of the Republic fleet. Maul was extremely grateful for the productiveness of the Dryden and the Pikes. He saw both as very productive allies. This would also secure Dryden a safe place under Maul and Savage for the time being. At the same time, Maul and his brother continued training. Maul wasn't stupid. He knew that once the Clone Wars ended, they would have to face the power of the Jedi. That is, if the Jedi survived the Clone Wars. But Maul nonetheless was concerned about what would come if the Jedi were to come into combat with his crime syndicate. Though for now, it seemed that Crimson Dawn was going unnoticed in the galaxy, other than Ryloth and Mon Cala acknowledging them. At the same time, Anakin Skywalker was broken. He was on Utapau with his master, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and they were currently on a recon mission. Though there was an issue, Anakin was struggling with the loss of his former friend and mentor, Sheev Palpatine, and he was struggling even more with the departure of his Padawan, Ahsoka Tano. It had only been a couple months since Palpatine died, and a couple of weeks since Ahsoka was forced out of the Jedi Order. Anakin felt a lot. He didn't know who to confide in. Obi-Wan tried his best to help his student, but Anakin's emotions were violently out of control. He was on the verge of leaving the Order himself, but he was too focused on victory to leave the Order. He saw winning this war as a redemption for Palpatine, feeding into the flames of revenge. Anakin was focused on avenging Palpatine's death. And while he was led to assume it was because of Dooku, he was sorely mistaken. Obi-Wan and Anakin would have an elongated conversation on Utapau. The two of them had camped out, and they were talking about everything. Obi-Wan assured his former student that everything would be okay. He would be okay, and so would Ahsoka. He just needed to continue to trust the Force to guide him, and he would be alright. Anakin was extremely appreciative for Obi-Wan, but not being in combat allowed him time to think. And that time to think often led him back to negative thoughts. Dooku would begin to get more and more up in Chancellor Nix's face. He was trying to get the Chancellor of the Republic to send troops into the Outer Rim, specifically troops with Jedi. 
Dooku was preparing to have the Jedi move out across the galaxy and spread themselves thin. It would expose the core of the Republic and allow the Separatists to seize a magnificent victory on Coruscant. While Dooku knew about Order 66 and even implemented the clones with the chips to secure the downfall of the Jedi, without Sidious, Dooku didn't plan on bringing a swift and decisive end to the Jedi Order. He saw it as wrong to punish the entire Order for the actions of the few. While he believed the Jedi should be much less political, he didn't believe that everyone should be executed inside of the Order. Though if the Jedi were off Coruscant, then the Separatists could secure an easy victory, and then take over the galaxy with little resistance. It would cause a lot of struggle for the Republic to survive without their capital planet, though there was one issue for Dooku. Because the banking clans became much richer, with one of their own being the Chancellor of the Republic, Chancellor Nick's card would begin to feel more and more empathy towards the Republic. It wasn't a difficult choice when one came from one of the richest planets in the galaxy. Nick's card saw the Republic as the best choice for his personal and planetary well-being. Dooku would push back against Nyx, but then all communications would be ended with Dooku. The Separatists were now completely in the dark, and the banking clans would separate themselves from the Separatist Alliance. This was a brave move by the banking clans, but it did nothing but enrage the easily angered Separatists. The fact that one of their own betrayed them for the Republic was a threat to their power. With Chancellor Nick's card fully joining the ranks of the Republic, it meant that the banking clans would stop playing shady business with the Republic, and instead they would offer the best deals and support the Republic as best they could. Though this would warrant a sizable fleet to protect the banking clan planet. This also meant another thing. Chancellor Nick's card would have to reveal to the Jedi the plot that Dooku had been trying to conceive to overthrow the Republic. By drawing the Jedi Council out into the Outer Rim, he would use the weakened capital city of Coruscant as a staging grounds for a siege. The Jedi Council realized that Dooku had been influenced to do evil in the galaxy. Nyx made sure to not to inform the Jedi Council about Order 66 and the Clone Trooper inhibitor chips, he did make sure that the Jedi had their faith in him. This would create a tight unison between the Jedi and the Chancellor. Chancellor Nyx wanted to ensure that his people would successfully win by the end of the conflict. For the Mun, it was very clear that the war was profitable, and while Chancellor Nix didn't want to keep the war going, he was going to take full advantage of what the war would offer in terms of profit towards his constituents, especially because most of the Senate was still in favor of the galaxy being at war. Dooku found this move rather repulsive, but he knew he couldn't openly attack Scipio or Coruscant anymore. He had to play this strategy successfully, though there was also one benefit. Admiral Trench and the Techno Union had just devised a way to start winning battles more consistently, though it would take a couple more months to finish. There was a clone trooper, an Arc Trooper, captured at the Citadel earlier in the second year of combat. Arc Trooper Echo was brought to the Techno Union facility to study, only for the Techno Union to discover that he held important secrets regarding Republic battle strategy. They would begin to hook Echo up to a machine, replacing some of his lost limbs with robotic replacements and gears that would line his chest and skull to ensure that he wouldn't die of natural causes. His information would then be extracted and sent to Separatist High Command, where the Seppis would use the strategies in their battles whenever they needed to counterattack the Republic and win a battle. While this development was still months away from being completed, it would be a useful tool to the Separatists very, very soon. The crime families in the Outer Rim saw Maul and Savage and Dryden as great tools for profit. While the Huts weren't fans of being under control of the Crimson Dawn, there was still one crime group that continuously evaded joining the ranks of this criminal empire. They were some of the cruelest slavers in the galaxy, and Maul wanted them within their ranks. Very badly. He knew how to play nice with them, though. These slavers were not fond of aggressive negotiations, and so Maul sent Dryden to Zygeria to strike up a deal with the Zygerian slavers. Alongside Dryden would be a council member from each of the representative crime families. They would each help him with his deal. They were under strict rules to help Dryden secure this deal. They were not to get feisty with the Zygerians. Because each of the crime families always had a reason to dislike the other, but they had to negotiate kindly with these slavers. After several hours of negotiation, Dryden was able to bring the Zygerians into Crimson Dawn. The crime families across the Outer Rim, for the first time ever, fully unified. As for Maul, he was equally as thrilled when he discovered a young man who was out on his own, trying to make a name for himself. His name was Tiber Zan. He was a fierce kid who just wanted to grow extreme riches and find himself put on a power throne. 
on a throne of power. He saw Maul as a useful ally to achieve this some sort of power. With Crimson Dawn as a fully united force, the crime underworld began to grow prosperously. So much so that Maul had no issue sending members of his faction to Coruscant to draw up trouble. The more crime in the core, the more reason for planets to rally to a cause that would actually protect their interests. It was a relatively similar format to what happened on Mandalore, though the issue with Coruscant and other deep core worlds was that they usually had garrisons of elite troops stationed everywhere. Coruscant had the Coruscant Guard, and Cato Nemodia had countless numbers of battle droids and commando droids. Taking advantage of these weaknesses would certainly prove to be a difficult task for Crimson Dawn to take a hold of. Though as the Clone Wars heated up and the core became less safeguarded, it was evident as the Republic and the Separatists took their war effort away from the core that the core would see less protection. Though for one of Crimson Dawn's earliest victories, they would see the beginning of a struggle. It would come from the form of Bo-Katan. She would reach out across the stars for the aid of the Jedi Order. While Anakin had been on the verge of losing his mind, he was extremely relieved to reunite with his apprentice again. The reunion would be a little bittersweet, especially since Ahsoka, since her departure, had matured so much. Ahsoka was on Coruscant with two twins for an extended period of time, when Bo-Katan reached out to her. Bo-Katan told Ahsoka that Maul was on Mandalore and that the people were suffering. Though the issue is, is that the people of Mandalore were not suffering. Prime Minister Almec, while corrupt, led Mandalore well, and the military leader present on the planet, currently in Gar Saxon, was giving new life to Mandalorian society. And while the society under Satine was used to peace, the regime led by Maul was certainly not peaceful, but their resolve was good enough for the Mandalorians to stick with them. Though for the Jedi, who last heard of Maul being on Mandalore, they were eager to believe Bo-Katan but Kenobi being himself wouldn't just dispatch anyone to Mandalore. There was a little, very important thing called a treaty, and that existed between the Republic and Mandalore. Obi-Wan told Bo that he would consult in the council as she ridiculed him for his slow action, asking him if he truly loved Satine. It was a deep cut, but Obi-Wan kept his resolve as he turned away and spoke to the Jedi Council about what would be done in terms of liberating Mandalore from Maul. The council would approve of this action, but it would take him time to decide, and they would allow him to decide on how he wanted to go about this. Anakin during this time was showing Ahsoka to the men of the 501st, the few hundred men who served with her when she was once their commander. These clones gave a very warm welcome to Ahsoka, as they welcomed her with open arms, and a paint job resembling her birthmarks across her face. Ahsoka was extremely grateful for this kind gesture. Anakin also had one more surprise for his former student, but it wouldn't be long before Obi-Wan came running through the doors as the ship's alarms began to ring. It was Coruscant, a gutsy maneuver for sure, but Dooku had his reasons. Chancellor Nick's car was no longer listening to Dooku, and he'd cut off all communication with the Count. It was a desperate move by Dooku to take Nyx into Separatist hands and make a bargaining for him. Not just with the Republic, but with the banking clans. At first, the banking clans leaving the CIS wasn't a big deal, but once the funds started to look a little dry at certain moments, Dooku realized the luxury of having the banking clans as a part of his little droid rebellion. The battle over Coruscant was massive, the largest battle seen in millennia. In a quick hasty action, Anakin would divide the 501st into two separate groups as he assigned Captain, now Commander Rex, to join Ahsoka, while the rest of his division returned to Coruscant to help free the Chancellor. Obi-Wan wasn't trying to play politics, but the Senator of the Republic was crucial in the grand scheme of things, and while Ahsoka felt justified to put Obi-Wan through the ringer, some of which was justified, she would begin to realize the trap that Bo-Katan had accidentally led the both of them into. The Republic split up its fleet as Ahsoka and Bo-Katan would arrive over Mandalore, the same time Anakin and Obi-Wan would arrive over Coruscant. For the Mandalorians, and especially Prime Minister Almec, this was an unwelcome surprise. The Republic had just declared war on Mandalore out of nowhere. As the Mandalorians moved to defend themselves and their people, Almac contacted his master, as he informed Maul that the Republic had launched an invasion of Mandalore. While Maul didn't really care much for Mandalore or their ways, he saw political brilliance to this assault. This could be brilliant for Crimson Dawn. Because the Republic jumped into combat with a neutral system, Crimson Dawn could be seen as heroes for defending Mandalore. 
There was one key factor for Maul that always led him to stay interested in Mandalore. The planet led the Neutral Systems Coalition, thanks to Satine. And while these systems were decidedly out of the galactic conflict, if Mandalore could be openly attacked or invaded by the Republic after centuries of treaties, then what stopped the Republic from doing the same to any one of them? Once Maul heard this from Almec, he moved every single available unit to Mandalore. They were going to wipe the floor with the clone army, and whoever was there invading the planet. The galaxy would see that Crimson Dawn stood for the little man. The independent one. The one who wasn't protected by the warmongering CIS or the Republic. Maul again knew the importance of a victory here, so he told Almec to have all the Mandalorians protect the innocents and escape into the tunnels until Crimson Dawn got back to save them from the clones. The Siege of Mandalore would go quickly for the Republic. They faced little resistance on the way down, and once Bo-Katan and the clones got into the city, it was barren. The throne room was equally as barren as all the important members of Crimson Dawn and the Mandalorians retreated into the lower caverns. To the clones and Ahsoka, it looked as if Bo-Katan had lied to them. Of course, that didn't matter. To Bo, it seemed as if she claimed the throne that belonged to her family. Over Coruscant, the war came to a head as the Republic dug its heels in, and the Separatists hit with as much of a force as they could. Kenobi and Anakin would find themselves inside of the Invisible Hand, searching for N Chancellor Nick's card. Neither Jedi had interacted with the new Chancellor yet. Anakin never got warmed up to Chancellor card because Nix never pulled Anakin from combat. He never missed with the war effort. He allowed the Jedi to be generals, and he allowed tacticians such as Yularen and Tarkin to be military leaders. And for the military leaders, and even Anakin, it was a relief not to be pulled from combat or to be challenged by a Chancellor. But instead of a luxurious treatment that Sidious would have gotten if things went as planned, Chancellor Carr was being treated like any other hostage as he was thrown into a cell and electrocuted for being a traitor to the CIS. Obi-Wan and Anakin would be able to save Chancellor Carr without ever interacting with Dooku. There wouldn't be a duel on the Invisible Hand, as the two Jedi ushered the Chancellor off ship to one of the closest Venators, while the Chancellor would find safe passage back to Coruscant. But because the Separatists were here on war business, the battle over Coruscant was prolonged. The fleets on both sides took their fair share of damage, but at the end of the day, the Republic was able to secure a prideful victory over Coruscant. On Mandalore, Ahsoka would address the Council, telling them that there was no sign of the Sith, or even Death Watch on the planet. Mace Windu was extremely unhappy with this. It meant that the Republic declared war on a completely innocent system. Mandalore of all innocent systems, and invaded a planet with no reason for them to do so. Mace pondered as he told Ahsoka to stay put for the time being. The Jedi would sort out the issue after the Council addressed the war effort. Ahsoka wasn't extremely thrilled with the fact that the Council would just ignore this issue and then come back to it. But there was nothing she could do to change the Council's decision to take his time on deciding what to do regarding Mandalore Gate. After she ended the transmissions, the power of the capital city went off. It was nighttime. ATTE sat dormant in the streets as clone troopers slept on top of bridges and under their walkers. There were few on patrol, one of them being Captain Vong. The clones were unsuspecting to an attack, because they faced no resistance during their landing procedure. They were ready to pack up and go home. It would all change when the Republic fleet above was cut off from communication to the surface and to other systems. Crimson Dawn would lead a harrowing attack against the Republic as the completely unprotected fleet was shattered into pieces. While the fleet had plenty of capital ships, most of the crews were sleeping. The campaign had very obviously been won and there was no reason for crews to be on high alert. That was until their ships were rattling with explosives crashing through their hulls. While the Republic fleet in space crumbled, Crimson Dawn sent his landing craft down to the surface. There were several elite troops coming down to the surface and out of the tunnels below. Maul and Savage took a landing party towards the throne room, expecting to find a Jedi commander, or whoever it was that thought it was a good idea to pick a fight with Crimson Dawn. As a silent, even eerie night carried on, it was awoken by a loud crashing and then screaming. Clones called out to their brethren as many brothers were shot in their sleep. Men who were barely awake ran to their vehicles, but it was no use. The crime family stepped in and made short work of the clone troopers present on Mandalore. Captain Vong and his men were completely caught off guard, and the crossfires they stood little to no chance. As for the few Mandalorians serving under Bo-Katan, they would share the same fate as the clones. For Ahsoka and Bo, who were inside of the throne room, they too were caught off guard by the massive amount of death crying out into the streets of the city. But before they could do anything, like 
try and call for reinforcements or even help the men they dragged into this hellhole, they were faced with two Zabrak brothers, and the warrior leader of Mandalore, Gar Saxon. Maul and Savage weren't playing around. They defeated the most powerful Sith in the galaxy in this room, and they were not going to let some reject Jedi beat them. Lightsabers ignited in the halls as Maul and Savage moved in duality. Bo-Katan and Gar Saxon got into a heated exchange in the same throne room that took Bo's sister. Maul and Savage by this point had achieved a new level of power. They thrived off of their bond as brothers, and because they often practiced one on another, they grew to incredible duelists. Ahsoka was an extremely well accomplished Jedi Padawan, and had she stayed in the Jedi Temple, it was extremely likely she could stand a better chance here. But as Maul and Savage moved into combat, they began throwing Ahsoka around like a hollow ball. She held her lightsabers up, but their strikes pushed her back. Bo-Katan wasn't doing too hot for herself either. Gar Saxon was a magnificent warrior, and without taking anything away from Bo, she was too. The throne room was currently overwhelmingly negative for Bo and Ahsoka. Savage picked Ahsoka up by the neck as he got into close range with her as he threw her across the room into Bo-Katan. Ahsoka bounced into the hard floors of the throne room. Savage, Maul, and Saxon all walked up as they surrounded these rebels. The gunfire could still be heard echoing from the streets. The sounds of Mandalorians and Crimson Dawn members slaughtering clones filled the air. As Bo and Ahsoka stood their ground, they were backed into a corner. Maul had had enough of this. He was on an important mission and he had to turn it over to Dryden Voss so that he could lead this counterattack on Mandalore. He reached out with the force and raised both Ahsoka and Bo into the air as he choked them to death. Savage growled as he hurled his lightsaber toward the two of them as they were both decapitated in the throne room. Their bodies dropped lifelessly to the ground as Maul turned around and walked out of the room. Savage and Gar Saxon followed their leader as he stepped out onto the patio. The Battle of Mandalore cascaded across the sightline, but it was rarely a rout. Clones that weren't killed sleeping were killed trying to grab their blasters, or trying to get to their vehicles. Clones that were on patrol stood little chance, but their numbers dwindled as they all fell back to their commander and ARC Trooper Jesse. Both were seated under an ATTE, the only one that had men inside of it. The clones held themselves together as they began to become encircled. A massive shell hit the ATTE in the middle of the group as the clones were thrown from their feet. Those who weren't killed in the explosion were shot on sight. Rex, who was pinned down under the leg of a walker, cried out in agony as he looked up into the face of a Black Sun member, who pulled his helmet off and shot the clone commander in the face. Jesse watching this jumped to his feet, only to have rounds of blasters fill his chest. As Maul snickered to himself, the echoing of blaster fire stopped. The entire groups of clones were massacred, their leaders killed, and their little war on Mandalore would be turned against the Republic and the CIS. Maul would immediately request Prime Minister Almec to the throne room. Maul had a very important mission for him. He was going to contact the coalition of neutral systems that followed Mandalore's rule. He was then going to tell them that the Republic openly attacked Mandalore for no reason, and that any of the other planets in this coalition could become targets of the galactic scale war. Most of these systems were extremely concerned about this revelation. They would ask how they would protect themselves from the Republic or the Separatists if the same fate face down their worlds. Olmec brilliantly and expertly filled in the blanks as he told them that Crimson Dawn would protect them as they protected Mandalore. The planets hadn't heard of Crimson Dawn, but with some convincing, Olmec got most if not all of the neutral system coalition to join Crimson Dawn, each of the planets offering forward a local militia force and supplies that would allow Crimson Dawn to increase tenfold. Crimson Dawn wasn't just a criminal empire anymore, it was a third faction in the Clone Wars, a large enough faction to erect armies and fleets out of nowhere, and have enough political persuasion to turn planets from the Republic or the Separatists against their factions. This of course would take several weeks in actuality to see development, but during this time the Jedi would learn of the execution of the clones on Mandalore. While the Republic would be prompted to go into combat against Mandalore, Chancellor Nick's card reprimanded the Jedi for allowing this to happen. He was extremely distasteful towards the waste of resources so late into the war, and he would specifically punish Anakin Skywalker, forcing him to stay on Coruscant until for further notice. The only positive for this is the fact that Anakin and Padme were having their twins. This would bring a lot of distraction and even some happiness to Anakin. After having lost his apprentice and clone commander on Mandalore, he was going through another rough patch. 
just like the one he had when Palpatine died and Ahsoka left the temple. Anakin really struggled being away from the battlefront, and he was only left to dwell in his thoughts. Luke, Leia, and Padme were the biggest senses and the only sense of joy he had in his life. They were the only ones that brought him any happiness. And because Anakin was essentially grounded, Commander Oppo and the rest of the 501st were dispatched alongside different Jedi generals, sometimes being Kenobi, Plo Koon, or Mace Windu. While the Republic was losing one of its best Jedi generals, the war effort would see some stalling. But it didn't really change the war effort itself. Most of the war up until this point was a stalemate. Other than the decisive victory over Coruscant, on the other side of the galaxy, Crimson Dawn had an issue. There was a lot of power, but too much power being directed to one individual. While Maul was sentient enough to run the entire Crimson Dawn himself, if he could divide the power to keep power-hungry individuals away from his riches, then he would. So that's what Maul did, as he divided Crimson Dawn up and gave different sections to different leaders. These leaders would act as military operations, each of them providing a little bit of power to Crimson Dawn as a whole. And, as for the special mission Dryden Voss finished for Maul, he united all the loose cannon pirates across the galaxy, and joined them to the Criminal Empire. This included the legendary Hondo Anaka. While Hondo had a bad experience with Maul, he was a man about profit, and he saw profit, he took it. Crimson Dawn would recruit anything from bounty hunters to smugglers to assassins to basically anything that could do more to achieve power in the galaxy. Crimson Dawn's logo became a rallying cry for the unheard voices of the Outer Rim. Maul knew exactly what he was doing when he raised up armies of recruits and volunteers from everywhere in the Outer Rim. For the most part, Crimson Dawn avoided interacting with the Republic or the Separatists. The Criminal Empire needed to work quickly to avoid conflict with either faction, because after every large-scale battle, each side had remnants, scraps left behind. The criminals would commandeer these instruments of war and fill their arsenal. They did it at Mandalore, though for Crimson Dawn they had the opportunity to make a big deal with one of the Separatist Council's most important members. While Geonosis had been besieged and taken over by the Republic after the Second Battle of Geonosis, Crimson Dawn made a deal with Pogba the Lesser, saying that if Crimson Dawn freed the Geonosians and their droid factories, they would all be turned back on and they would mass produce battle droids for the Criminal Empire. While this took some serious convincing, the massive arsenal of credits that Maul had with him could convince anyone in the galaxy. After all, the war lasted much longer than anyone in the CIS thought, and with Nick's card and the banking clans fully backed in the Republic, Separatist cash flow had been decreasing. Crimson Dawn's political power also interested Poggle because, as a third faction in the galaxy, divided, it had the perfect opportunity to take power away from the Republic or the Separatists. The Clone Wars had entered its fourth year of combat, and it was obvious across the galaxy that people were sick and tired of this galactic-scale war. They wanted it to end, and the end was not in sight. The war wasn't even close to ending, and it was even worse because it was perpetuated by the mass production of battle droids. The clones were much superior fighters, but their odds continued to get worse and worse. As for Chancellor Nick's card, he was having a bit of an issue with the Jedi. Some of their members were rather insubordinate to the will of the Republic officials, and after the catastrophe on Mandalore, he was ready to pull the plug on the Jedi generals. The truth was, though, that Nyx knew he couldn't just do that. The Jedi were great warriors, and they helped the Republic win battles that wouldn't have been otherwise. One notable battle was the Battle of Anaxus, which saw the downfall of Admiral Trench. The Battle of Coruscant may have bolstered morale for the Republic, but it also saw an increased population line for the Separatists. With the increasing rising conflict and the criminal expansion, Boba Fett and Cat Bane would find themselves begrudgingly working with one another on Coruscant's lower levels. The Criminal Empire used racketeering on high-end core planets to draw in extra income. They also sold illegal arms and anything from spice to death sticks to help maximize profits. While Cad Bane and Boba were down in the lower levels, they ran into two Force users. Their lightsabers were no match for the quick draw of the fastest hands in the galaxy. Bane was able to help capture Quinlan Voss, a Jedi Master, and Asajj Ventress on the lower levels of Coruscant. Ventress had been trying to get off-world to kill Dooku, and while she never died during her failed assassination attempt on Christophsis, she returned the Coruscant with Quinlan so that they may continue living their life together. Both of them wanted revenge on Dooku, but seeing as they were both now being held captive, they couldn't afford to live a normal life anymore. 
The capture of these two individuals didn't really have a lasting effect on either side of the war effort, but both Quinlan and Asajj would be executed aboard Maul's flagship by his apprentice. Maul and Savage had a massive flagship. It was a new model Keldo-class battleship. There were about three of them in production and they were produced across the Outer Rim. They were much larger than the large Resurgent-class cruisers and they were much larger than Providence-class battleships. These battleships would certainly be able to stand up against the CIS and Republic fleets. Tyrazan had also been working with Dryden Voss and Hondo Anaka to develop a new star cruiser, called an Aggressor-class battleship. They were thin, longer battleships that had a massive barrel at the end of their hull that could shoot massive blasts. Maul and Savage sat in their battleship as they continuously got briefed on the daily about the growth of their empire. While Crimson Dawn expanding inside of the core wasn't exactly taking over planets, it was more about making an impact culturally. Crimson Dawn had a lasting effect on the cultures of the core worlds, even pristine ones such as Cato Nemodia, Alderaan, and Coruscant. Maul loved that he was able to make a change in public opinion on the war with the lowlifes. But the truth was, people in the galaxy were getting sick and tired of the war. Maul knew this and he began to pair Dryden and Tiber up together, so that they may work on bringing the people of the core to the aid of Crimson Dawn. At the same time, Crimson Dawn's main fleet would group up outside of Hypori, one of their greatest industrial worlds, and they would launch a direct invasion of Genosis from there. The Genosians on the ground would be warned that Crimson Dawn would be making a move for their homeworld. Pago the Lesser would also begin to distance himself from the Separatists. But just as he was about to, Maul told him to keep close contact with them. They would be able to use it in the future. The fleet would arrive at a hyperspace and catch the Republic completely off guard. While unlike the fleet over Mandalore, the men were at their stations. They were greatly confused as to why pirates would be here. See, Crimson Dawn didn't operate like a normal combat group. It would send waves of troops in at different times to make an enemy fleet question the real size of their opponent. It was a great morale buildup for Crimson Dawn, but it tore apart the morale of an enemy fleet. As the first wave of Crimson Dawn left hyperspace, the Republic assumed it was either pirates or it was just a cargo run passing by, stopping to make a change in direction. The fleet was completely caught off guard when lasers began to fill the space above Genesis. The fleet above Genesis wasn't too large, and they had a golden platform set up to aid the planetary defense. The Republic fleet fought well, and then another fleet exited hyperspace from the west, and then one from the east. Maul's flagship and the main bulk of the firepower entered the space above Genesis and began opening fire. The Republic fleet wasn't built to handle this much fleet combat, as acclimators and acquaintances crumbled under firepower. The two Venators stood behind the main fleet as it began to target the Republic fools. Within only the matter of an hour or two, Geonosis belonged back into the hands of Crimson Dawn, and so did the factories. Pago the Lesser was very ecstatic about this freedom for his population, especially considering Dooku wasn't willing to throw any of his resources towards Genosis at all. With Genosis under Crimson Dawn, control of the fight began to seem even more in their hands than before. Even better, the first order of flagships from Mon Calamari had just come in from Mon Cala. There was also something incredibly helpful to aid Crimson Dawn, a young Chiss man who offered his services to Crimson Dawn. Mithraru Narando Kivaru Nuraturaru, otherwise known as Thrawn, saw the war between the Separatists and the Republic as a perfect reasoning to side with Crimson Dawn. If neither side could settle their differences in four years, then both governments were fractured. It would take the unstoppable determination of someone to aid the growth of a new government that could bring harmony to the galaxy. Thrawn would serve Maul only if he was promised a future in this galaxy with Maul. Maul was always good about giving people what they wanted in order to ensure their loyalty, and it worked perfectly with the it worked perfectly with Gar Saxon and the Mandalorians. It was a one-time strategy turned into a long-term strategy. Though before Maul got too antsy, he would hear from inside sources inside of the Republic about a secret session. The session would be called by Chancellor Nix. It was evident throughout the core that the Jedi had lost popularity and were being blamed almost solely for the continuation of the Clone Wars. Part of this was also done by Crimson Dawn's inner city and inner core work. 
but the populace wanted the Jedi gone, and so Chancellor Nix was trying to secure popularity for the coming election and decided that he would go and challenge the Senate with the chance to change the outcome of the war. Believing that the Jedi were detrimental to the war effort, especially because of the whole Mandalore situation, the Senate would vote alongside of the interim Chancellor and the population of their constituents. While there were those who were friends with the Jedi, it didn't matter. The overwhelming population of the Senate voted to take more loans from the banking clans only a year and a half before, and they would also vote to execute Order 66 in a 99% vote. Within the coming hours, an array of Venators would arrive over the Jedi Temple. The people around the area would be quietly evacuated as an orbital bombardment would commence, obliterating the Jedi Temple. Across the galaxy, clones with Executive Order 66 running through their comlinks would open fire on their Jedi Generals. Very few, if almost no Jedi, would survive this incursion. One of the only exceptions being Anakin Skywalker, who is currently inside of his wife's apartment. She hadn't been able to warn Anakin because the Senate was kept inside of the Senate chambers while Chancellor Nix gave the order. Anakin watched as the Jedi Temple erupted into a ball of flames as he felt the catastrophe across the galaxy. Not even his friends survived, neither did his master. The Jedi were completely wiped off the map, giving the clone commanders full control of their armies. This move surprised even the likes of Dooku and Maul, neither of which could have foreseen this happening. Though with the Jedi being wiped out, the Galactic Republic would move itself into a more militaristic approach to warfare. As for Padme, she would be incredibly relieved to find Anakin in her home when she returned. He was with the children, not saying a word. While he had his issues with the Jedi, he never would have wanted them to suffer and die the way they did. Anakin wanted revenge, but he knew that he himself was a target to the Republic, and if he showed his face, then it was very likely Padme could become endangered, and that was nothing he wanted for her or their children. So Anakin stayed silent. He let his emotions fill his mind as he wallowed in his pain alone. His wife didn't know how to help him. She tried to be there when Palpatine, Ahsoka, and Rex died, but this was the entire Jedi Order. Anakin had a very bad sense of survivor's guilt. He knew he needed to try and help himself so he could raise his children, but he couldn't. It was an incredible pain. Everyone that he'd ever known was gone, and it especially hurt to know that it was Kenobi who died in the Order too. Of course, there were survivors across the galaxy, but as of right now, with the Clone Wars going on, there was nowhere safe for surviving Jedi to be. Droids were ordered to kill on sight, and now the clones were too. Maul, Thrawn, and Dryden all knew that the Republic had weakened itself. Now it was time for the CIS to experience this same weakness. The Republic wouldn't sign a peace treaty with the Separatists, because earlier in the war, Coruscant was attacked for trying to have a peace treaty, so they wouldn't fall for this again. The only way the war would end would be through the total annihilation of an enemy faction. Both the CIS and Republic knew what the stakes were. Maul and Savage also knew that this war would be a ton of death. So Maul and Savage used Pogla the Lesser to help them know the precise location of Count Dooku. Maul wasn't too concerned with Grievous. The biggest concern were the other Force users. The reason Maul loved Dryden, Tiber, and Thrawn was the fact that they weren't Force sensitive. It also helped that they were extremely loyal to him and Savage. But the news came back from Poggle, and he had information of where Dooku was going to be. He and some of the other Separatist leaders were grouping up on Mustafar. It was a mining world, and they were discussing a strategy with the Jedi being gone, though they didn't realize that this would be their downfall. Under Poggle's escort, both Maul and Savage were able to sneak onto the facilities of Mustafar. The meeting with the Separatists began as Dooku addressed the leaders, telling them that he was projecting a Separatist victory in over a year and a half. From the corner of the room, he heard laughing. All the Separatist leaders turned their head to see two horned men walk in past their guard. Dooku frowned. He knew Savage, and he could only assume that the other one was his brother. Dooku spoke down to them as he stood up from his seat and faced down the two Zaprek brothers. The three spaced themselves out from the Separatist leaders as Dooku waited for the Zabraks to ignite their lightsabers. As Dooku waited, he berated Savage with insults to get him to lose his coal. But since the last time the two were faced off with one another, it seemed as if it didn't really matter. Savage was calm and collected as he stood in solidarity with his brother. Then, five lightsabers ignited, one being the dark saber as three converged in the middle of the room, swinging back and forth elegantly. While Sidious was a true swordsman, no one was as agile and confident as Dooku with a blade. 
Dooku was extremely formal in his style, too, as he ducked and weaved, using one hand to combat each of the brothers. Dooku watched as Savage moved in and kicked him in the stomach as he rolled around him, dashing back and forth between Maul's blades. The three Sith fought with one another to the death as they watched their crimson blades fill the room with red and the echoes doused the room in noise. The Sith were fighting a fight for who the true ruler of the Sith would become. This was a final stand for Maul and Savage so that they could become the one and only Sith duo in the galaxy. Though for Maul, he didn't believe it would stop there. He swung violently as Dooku stepped too much in advance. He was caught off guard as his hand flew from his wrist. Dooku had to admit it to himself. He knew he wouldn't win this battle. In his old age, he had gotten weaker. There was nothing that could really stop this slow decline for him. It happened whenever someone joined the dark side of the force so late into their lives. Dooku stepped back as he reached for the blade with his other hand, just to watch Savage charge him and swing his lightsaber through his body. Maul turned around and sheathed his lightsabers as he looked at the CIS leaders, standing silently in shock. They all assumed their lives were about to end, as Maul took a seat at the head of the table. He smiled sinisterly as he asked them who their allegiance was to. Wat Tambor of the Techno Union said that their allegiance was to one another and their alliance. Maul snickered as he told the foolish Techno Union man that his allegiance was to Maul and Crimson Dawn. The council looked at one another as they seen the question what it was that Maul was suggesting. Maul told them that they would join forces with him or they would lose to the Republic. The members of the council all didn't agree. Paga was the only one who saw this deal as profitable. Savage stepped into the room as he growled and the council looked at him. Maul shrugged his shoulders as he told Poggle to be excused. The bug flew out of the room as Savage ignited his lightsaber and threw it down the line of council members, killing every single one of them. Maul turned around and told Poggle that the Separatists were weakened. Their target was the Republic now. Poggle told Maul that there was an issue. The Separatists had a larger number of forces than the Republic. Maul again left as he reminded Poggle that Genosis had droids, and those droids were connected to the droid army. The Genosis factory would use the super tactical droids to have the CIS army turn against the Separatists that didn't stay loyal to Crimson Dawn. The irony of this is that Maul used the same plan on the Separatists that Sidious tried to use on the Republic, and Maul never knew. There was also one other wild card. Maul had defiler droids, and they were expert killers, hunters, and hackers. The three would depart Mustafar, as Dryden Voss would enter the Mustafar facilities to claim Mustafar for Crimson Dawn. This new territory would be used to a great effect by the Criminal Empire. Across the galaxy on Coruscant, Anakin and Padme decided that it was time for them to move away from Coruscant, and they would go back to Padme's homeworld of Naboo, and live their life there. Anakin was still struggling greatly. He lost weight significantly, and he slept very little. His emotional well-being was only being held together by his family, but even that seemed to not be enough for him. Anakin would take care of the kids, and then he wouldn't be seen for hours. Sometimes he'd go for walks, and sometimes he'd lay in the water floating lifelessly. Anakin struggled immensely with the loss of the Jedi Order. Padme would often be found trying to console him. She abandoned the Senate because she knew she needed to be present for her kids and her husband. But Anakin was very unresponsive. He was essentially a walking dead man. His heart was hurt, and he was even more so broken. He stopped using a lightsaber and even buried it in the dirt atop of the mountain, where he and Padme often went. Anakin wanted to stay with his kids and forget about the ways of the Jedi and Sith. He just wanted to be normal. Sometimes he would just work with machines, but not even that would draw happiness from him. He was so lost. While Anakin underwent mental disarray, Maul and Savage loaded up a fleet and prepared for it to move on to Alderaan. It was one of the most prideful planets of the core. While it wouldn't be a violent takeover, it would be an expression of force to see what the Republic would do in response. If the Republic responded with hostility, then it would prove to be their downfall. Maul and Dryden had a plan at works here, and they would ensure that it would take full advantage of this plan. With the fleet en route to Alderaan, Poggle the Lesser would launch an invasion of another peaceful world in the core, Corellia. With a fleet that looked like a Separatist fleet, it would be a perfect resolution to put blame on the Separatists for enacting such a rambunctious tactic. It would divide the galaxy further, and it would also show that the invasion of Alderaan was simply a show of peaceful resolve to the Clone Wars. There would be one more thing. Savage was leading a crew of elite troops down to Kamino to steal the clone Gino. Savage had Gar Saxon, Tyberzan, and several other elite units with him. 
This three-way attack across the galaxy would displace the Republic and the Separatists. Especially since the downfall of Dooku and the Separatist Council, the Separatists were under the control of General Grievous himself. Grievous was vicious, and he didn't really care for the terms of war, but he did care about the downfall of the Jedi. He wished that the Jedi would have been killed by him. Regardless, he had a collection of lightsabers and the largest droid army the galaxy had ever seen under his command. When the Separatists attacked Corellia, well, the quote-unquote Separatists, he was extremely surprised and even angry. But he would discover that these droids were not being operated by the Separatists. They were going rogue. He had two options, back them up, or kill them and take over Corellia for himself. Over Alderaan, Crimson Dawn stood defensively. On the ground, Bail Organa called for Republic reinforcements, and Chancellor Nick's card ignorantly sent the Republic after them, exposing Coruscant to invasion and allowing the now besieged Corellia to fall into the hands of Crimson Dawn. With the bulk of the Republic fleet going after Crimson Dawn, the fleet would prepare for a battle. Grievous, whose spies were watching this dedicatedly, realized that Coruscant was open for another invasion. This could be the final straw to win the Clone Wars for the Republic or the Separatists. On Kamino, the Strike Force also landed, and they were preparing to do away with the Kloon Jean. The stage was set for chaos to befall the Republic, though there was one reserve planned for Crimson Dawn. In case the Separatists invaded Coruscant during this time of chaos, while Paul the Lesser thought it would be incredibly stupid for the CIS to attack Coruscant, he forgot that General Grievous was the leader of the droid faction. So when the Separatists moved in for Coruscant, the Techno Union and all the other remaining droid facilities would face the same purge. Crimson Dawn was going to use a Separatist motherboard on Sereno to turn the droid army into the army of Crimson Dawn. While a successful invasion of Coruscant would do Crimson Dawn well, a saving of Coruscant would do them better, especially if they could control the droids and force them to retreat. It was the ultimate version of the Mandalore plan, taking an enemy force down to innocent people and then saving them, making Crimson Dawn look like heroes. It was exactly what they did to Mandalore only a few years before, and it would now be brought to the galaxy-wide level. Maul knew what he wanted, and what it was that he wanted was power. Over Alderaan, a massive battle took place. While the Republic fleet was tough, facing down Mon Calamari cruisers and their infinite shields alongside the Kadolb class battleships with more firepower than any other vessel seen since the Malevolence, the Republic was in the fight for its life. With Captain Tarkin and Admiral Yularen leading the assault, they would find themselves in a predicament. They would be caught off guard by the strikingly powerful Crimson Dawn fleet that would tear through their lines. The Separatists over Coruscant would do the same thing to the Republic. It was an easy picking. Because the Republic didn't go after Corellia, the third fleet of Crimson Dawn moved to protect the people of Corellia from Poggle's armies. It was again the Mandalore plan, a perfect plan executed to perfection. While the first and second fleets from Crimson Dawn took on the Republic, they found themselves achieving almost a perfect victory, with only a couple of flagships showing signs of damage. Maul wasn't going to stop. After seemingly obliterating the Republic at Alderaan, and the CIS obliterating the Republic over Coruscant, Chancellor Nick's card began to realize the issue of his ways, and the ignorance of his decision. At the same time on Kamino, Savage, Tiberzan, and Saxon snuck through the Kaminoan facilities. They left bombs everywhere on the inside so that they could trap the Kaminoans and the clones stationed on the base. The bombs were set into position as they got into the clone genome room and ran off to the genes of Jango Fett. The clones and Kaminoans weren't ready when they were soon met with death itself. The strike team was able to escape with very little encounters, and as they escaped, the entire Topoka city was bombed. Clones, cadets, scientists, defective clones, and Kaminoans all sunk to the bottom of the ocean, as those who weren't killed in the initial bombing drowned to death under the crushing weight of the infrastructure trapping them. Over Coruscant, Crimson Dawn arrived, just as they did, the Defiler droid hacked into the CIS mainframe and took hold of the Separatist military. The Defiler droid put the Separatist army under the control of Maul. By the time Maul arrived, the droids had burned down most of the city and were currently holding the Senate chambers under their control. Grievous was cutting through the Senators and was making his way to the Chancellor's office. The guards inside of the Senate chambers stood no chance. Coruscant sirens rang out throughout the city as people cried out in terror. The Separatists ran through the people and cut them down execution style. Buildings were turned apart for the Separatist warships, and then Crimson Dawn showed up. With the Defiler controlling the droid warships and droid armies, Crimson Dawn was able to easily crush the resistance. Maul and an elite group of infiltrators infiltrated the Senate, as Maul searched far and wide for General Grievous. 
The senators, still alive, were terrified, but when Maul confronted Grievous, they felt safe. Maul was quick to engage with Grievous, as his elite guard helped him break Grievous' defense. Maul was able to defeat Grievous in the Senate building, while the cityscape showed Crimson Dawn begin to rout CIS forces from Coruscant. While it wasn't obvious to the citizens that this was a setup, it was obvious that Crimson Dawn had just saved them. Crimson Dawn and Maul were hailed as heroes of the Republic, and while Crimson Dawn was the new power in town, it wasn't going to be the Republic. Crimson Dawn made it aware to the people of the Republic that they were not the Republic, and they would not be titled to the Republic. They were independent of the Republic and the CIS. Maul then told the people of the Republic that they would protect Coruscant and win the war that the Jedi and clones could not. It was simply brilliant. Maul knew it, and so did everyone else inside of Crimson Dawn. Though with a democratic style like the Republic, Maul needed to make an impact on their decision, so that when his group of loyal servants could jump into power, he had democratic control. While Maul had no issue with seizing power from the Republic, he wanted to ensure longevity of his power. He didn't want to have to come back and fight for power anymore. He wanted it to be an easy life as a ruler of the galaxy. His wealth was valued at more than anything the Outer Rim and Mid Rim combined could come up with. His empire was greater than anything he expected it to be, and he saw the downfall of the Jedi, Republic, and CIS, and yet all of that was incredible. He wanted to enjoy his power, the power that he worked so hard to achieve. As Crimson Dawn went out across the galaxy, forging fake fights against the CIS, the clone army lost favor, and Crimson Dawn won over the hearts of the population. While Padme saw what was happening, Anakin dissuaded her from going back to the Republic. This truly broke her heart. She watched the hero of the Republic become fearful of what could become if he stood up for that same Republic. But Anakin knew that the Republic was gone, and in a way, it brought him contentment. Though for Anakin, the hardest thing for him to deal with was the loss of everyone he loved as he came to realize that maybe he didn't want everything he asked for. As much as he wanted to live and love Padme, he wouldn't have done it at the expense of all of his friends and the family that he'd come to know and love since the day he was brought into the Order. Sure, not all the Jedi were nice to him, but not even they deserved to be killed the way they were. Weeks would pass since the Second Battle of Coruscant, and Maul and Savage would return to Coruscant to address the Republic. The Republic, on the other hand, would completely accept him as their leader. He saved them from the CIS, and he ended a five-year war in weeks. Chancellor Nick's card would be ousted from power. The public perception of Maul was almost that of a god. He was pronounced a hero, and pronounced as such that they would put him on his pedestal. Maul was overly thrilled with this. He was the ruler of the galaxy, and no one could challenge him for his rule. Maul ensured that there would be a continuous passage of profit for him and his loyal friends, and with the Republic being replaced by Maul, he would establish a legacy of power. Anakin and his family would continue to find safety on Naboo, and enjoy staying away from the politics and live a safe life, though the question would stand if Luke and Leia would grow up to eventually stand with or go against Crimson Dawn. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to George Stewart, Benjamin Wells, Jay Hoffman, War Pigment 3, AC Raptor, Gore, and Chainsaw Lewis Sparrows for the channel. Let's hit 2,000 likes so we can see what if Anakin had a twin sister. I know you've been asking this for a long time, and I'm really excited for it. If you see a what if, let me know down below. I'm going to comment about doing crossovers. Check out the Twitch community Discord and Patreon to be part of the community. Some more other words. And for a giveaway, go down below. There's a pinned comment. Go to the docs, put your name on the docs. Again, for the giveaway, I will announce giveaway winners when we hit 50,000 subscribers. I don't have that right now. We have 35,000, so. 15,000 more and I will announce the giveaway. The person in the comment section is not me. Do not text me on Telegram because I don't have a Telegram, okay? Don't listen to him. He's asking for massages and I don't give massages, okay? He doesn't know how to spell massages. I write stories for a living. I know how to spell messages. Anyways, let's talk about our story. Our story here um, was interesting. Now, we don't usually have a very uh, political soap opera, and I think that's what this is. And I think it was really enjoyable to write. Honestly, it was a nice change of pace, because I got to focus on a larger scale of the galaxy. This story focuses on a lot more than just a single character. While, yes, it's about Maul and Savage, essentially, and how they killed Sidious, it shows what the galaxy could have happened, or what could have happened to the galaxy, had Sidious been removed from power. Because at first, when you see this title, you might like be like, oh yeah, whatever, the, the Sith die and the Jedi win. No. Uh, it, it depends on who gets elected as the interim chancellor. And I thought, you know, I've done it enough times with Bale or Padme becoming the interim chancellor or even the chancellor after Revenge of the Sith. So I decided what would happen if somebody from the banking clans became chancellor. And I decided to put Nick's card there because it's an interesting resolve. It's something that you haven't seen before. 
and something that you probably never heard of. I mean, he's in the Clone Wars like three or four times, and you, I don't, I didn't even know his name. I had to look up his name. I had to look up his name, you know. And it was, it was fun putting him in power because I think being that the Muns are so greedy and so focused on profit, I think that he would have actually swayed to the Republic because the Republic would see him as their profit margin. And I think it would be a smart decision for the Republic and a decision that they would make based on their tendency to want to win the war. If you want to win the war, you're going to choose the people that have the most profit and the people that are going to probably catch you a break if you support their, their one of their people. And having one of their people as the Chancellor would allow the banking clans to say, well, you know, maybe this Republic isn't too bad and we can take advantage of this, you know? And it kind of takes advantage of the whole thing that Ryan Johnson talks about in uh, The Last Jedi, and that's the whole profit of war. And I, I didn't go too deep into that because I didn't really want to morally make you question how bad greed and profit are, because I would assume you guys know that. But I wanted to take advantage of that, that thematic device to show that people can be dissuaded by profit and dissuaded or change their ways for money. And that's kind of the whole point of that that arc, I suppose. Um, there's a lot of A, B, C plots going on in this, in this story, and it, it's really a lot to comprehend, um, but it was a lot of fun. It really was. This is one of my my more fun works. It reminds me a lot of what I did with Anakin and what if he was raised by Mother Towson, which is one of my favorite stories, if I'm being honest. Um, and I, I really, I'm going to be honest with you guys, I'm very prideful of where this went. Uh, it took me longer than I thought it was going to go, and it was just because I like I kept kind of coming to a, a, a blank space. I kind of was like, okay, where do I go from here? Because it's it's galactic scale, you know. I'm talking about three whole factions, and that was the fun part about it. It's the fact that that you introduce a third faction. And for those of you that liked playing the, I believe it's a, a Legends game, Star Wars Empire at War, uh, Forces of Corruption, you got the Xan Consortium references and the battleships and the and the stuff like that. I, I that was completely inspired by that game. That was like my childhood. So little insight to me. Uh, that that game was amazing, and I still love that game. But inspiration from that was a lot of a lot of where the story came from. The inspiration of playing as a third faction against the two more popular factions. And I think with the Republic and and Separatists being at war, a third faction could have very easily risen. And that's kind of what happened in the absence of the Republic is Crimson Dawn took power until they were dethroned. And I think I think if if Mandalore had been invaded by the Republic, Maul could have used that to a political advantage to turn the neutral system coalition against the Republic and turn them into Crimson Dawn. And I think that really quick, you know, profit would have allowed them to grow. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this, this political soap opera that we did here, the story of, of politics and, and, and factions and war. I hope you all enjoyed the grand scheme of the story. And, um, I left it with a cliffhanger. Let you guys have some fun with the imagination. Anyways, I love you all. Spread the love, subscribe, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you. Thank you.